This is Gary Johnson. Uh, we're interviewing uh, Adley Stevenson. Uh, this is the second uh, tape. And we were uh, in your 1970 campaign for the Senate, where, where I have my own memories. Uh, one of the memories is the first class uh, quality of the people who were, th were your lieutenants in that game, people who uh, served in office for years afterwards, like Jim Houlihan, for, yeah. for example, uh, Larry Hansen, who wound up uh, serving in Washington, not an elective office, but... You mentioned Bo Cutter. Bo, Bo Cutter, who was the uh, director of office and management and budgets uh, and other positions. And then went into the private sector and Warburg Pincus. They, they all landed on their feet. They went Many of them went on with me. But they uh, went on from there. Now, uh, the actual campaign manager had a career of his own, Daniel Walker. Dan Walker, <laughs> who was governor. Oh. <laughs> and uh, I'm curious to know what your memories are of, of him. <laughs> well, oh boy, do I have memories. Uh, Dan Walker was involved in the Committee on Illinois Government. He was gen then he was general counsel on Montgomery Ward and conspicuously bright, I mean, really brilliant. Mm -hmm. But what I didn't know when I asked him to be uh, uh, chairman was that he was also kind of a megalomaniac. He was excessively um, ambitious. And no, he, he was humorless, um, but very efficient, very smart, very articulate and kind of a tragedy because he could have been a great uh, uh, public official. Um, as it was, uh, I started out with a little trouble, although it was not his fault. He was commissioned to uh, investigate the reaction of the Chicago police to the 68 convention, uh, had been earlier. And in that uh, report, among other things, which is very critical of the city, um, he uh, called the police stormtroopers in blue. Uh, he won no friends in City Hall. I had written a white paper which won me no, uh, uh, no, no friends. Uh, I didn't realize it, but he was very politically ambitious. Uh, we, you know, ran a very successful uh, uh, campaign, and come election night, I was uh, um, with the mayor, only Mary Mullen and maybe one or two other people, uh, in his party office, uh, watching the returns. And all of a sudden, I see, we see, Dan Walker at the microphone in front of the TV. And uh, he was giving a you know report, an optimistic report. And Daly turns to me and says, for heaven's sakes, call him and tell him not to claim victory uh, before all the ballots are counted. We have to keep our people in the precincts. Uh, I was way ahead. Uh, uh, so I called Dan and said, Dan, don't claim victory. We have to keep the workers in the precincts. We have to you know, help everybody on the ticket. We go back and watch for a little while longer. And the next thing I know, Dan Walker is back in front of the microphones claiming victory. Oh. And Mayor Daly turns to me and says, that man is running for governor. It had not occurred to me. Uh, uh, he was a very perceptive guy. Uh, and the next thing I know, uh, all my campaign records have disappeared. And on the day I get sworn in to the United States Senate, he announces his candidacy for a governor. And uh, he wins by walking the state, getting a lot of notoriety and a lot of publicity, and beating, if I recall correctly. Paul Simon. Yeah, beating the regular organization candidate who was first rate, Paul Simon. And that isn't the first time that happened. The,
the, uh, some of the worst people to get nominated in recent years have been the popular choice. Blagojevich is another example. Uh, the party tried to get me to run against uh, him. Uh, he, was, he was not the party choice. Well, Dan Walker, as you know, subsequently went to, went to jail. Right. Go, going back to the actual campaign, something else I remember was the, revolu the revelation that uh, the army was actually spying on your <laughs> campaign. <laughs> Yeah. Um, it was a y unit of army intelligence, and uh, I'm, you know, made light of it. I didn't, couldn't imagine what they'd find out. Although we did have kind of the feeling that it was difficult to have a conversation in my office without reading about it in the Chicago Tribune the next <laughs> uh, the next day. These were Nixon years. Nixon and Agnew were riding high. It was a dirty campaign by the standards of the time. Um, I was a ratty lib, uh, be partly, mainly because of the 68 convention, and they tried to associate me with the, you know, the protesters. Uh, um, uh, I had incidentally offset a lot of that by, by uh, uh, making Tom Foran, who was one of the prosecutors of the Chicago 7, and a very tough guy, uh, deputy campaign chairman. We got him out on the campaign trail, and that kind of neutralized, uh, uh, neutralized uh, Dan Walker. Uh, but, yeah, it was, it was, Agnew was in, and... It was the year of Kent State. Pardon? Kent State was that summer. Yeah, that's right. I forgot during uh, the actual because I I remember there were a lot of young people. The last thing after Kent State they wanted to do was work in a political campaign, but you managed to attract a lot of young idealistic campaign workers. Yeah. Well, I had opposed the war for a long time. That was the main issue, and the draft was on, which was very unpopular. Uh, as soon as the draft ended, a lot of the resistance to the war sort of subsided. Uh, but uh, I can't remember the margin. It was won by a substantial margin against Ralph Smith. Now, now remember, you're, of course, you were at the, the head of a ticket, and I remember going to a typical uh, township uh, rally where all the other members of the ticket were there, including the famous Paul Powell. <laughs> and I remember you're giving kind of a backhanded compliment to him uh, when, when you took your turn to get up at this rally. Uh, do you have any memories of Paul Powell? Yes. <laughs> oh, he was a nemesis of two generations. Uh, um, that was, you know, what Daly was doing. I, I would lead the ticket, and, and, and we had straight ticket voting in those days, so I'd help bring people in all the way down. Uh, I don't remember this um, inc incident. Uh, I do remember when my father was governor, um, he had a lot of authority because of that patronage. He'd really, and he'd go on the radio every week, and he'd really push his program to the legislature. At one point, he thanked Paul Powell, who was Speaker of the House then, for his support of a bill to increase truck license fees. And Powell uh, turned to him and said, well, I'm sure glad to have your thanks, Governor, because it cost me $50,000. Paul, of course, is the remembered best for having left over $800,000 in shoeboxes in his Springfield uh, <laughs> uh, closet. I remember being uh, asked for the press for a comment on Paul Simon's, uh, Paul, uh, who, uh, Paul, Paul Powell's Powell. death, uh, and saying uh, uh, his shoeboxes will be hard to fill. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he was terrible. He was really, 
bad man. Uh, So uh, you, you were elected in uh, 1970 to the Senate, and because you were filling uh, a vacancy, you actually were sworn in uh, quicker than you thought, and you actually got a little bump in your seniority. Yeah. Tell us about that. Well, there was a bill coming up, a consumer I think it was the Consumer Protection Act, and just to be safe, to make sure they had enough votes, they, they Democratic leadership asked me to get down there as fast as I could. And I had no problem with uh, Governor Ogilvie. He was very cooperative. He not only signed the certificates, he also made my deputy, uh, Chuck Woodford, uh, my successor as a straight treasurer, which is a smart thing to have done and a decent thing. So you're right, I, get it. I, I went in early, which gave me seniority on all of the uh, uh, person selected that year to the United States uh, uh, Senate. And it was a big class of, uh, we had a very substantial Democratic majority. But, you know, as I've thought back, we really didn't divide over issues. And by, Nixon was president, um, and he was no favorite of the Stevensons. He had vilified my father. And, in fact, nobody in the Congress who knew him really respected him, uh, but he was the president. And uh, as I look back, by today's standards, Richard Nixon would have been a liberal activist uh, working on environmental. Uh, we, we worked with the people in his administration and mm -hmm. environmental protection legislation. Um, legal services. Legal services, consumer. Uh, Product safety, I mentioned, there were others. He even, you know, imposed wage and price controls. So this would be radical by today's democratic uh, uh, standards. The party, uh, well, the, the party shifted to the right. The whole process uh, uh, shifted to the right, but I, uh, you know, I, I'm repeating, I think, but even during his uh, impeachment, which I had something to do with, maybe Elliot Richardson, uh, I knew from Harvard, and he was appointed uh, attorney general. And when his nomination, wait a minute, I'm getting, when his nomination came up, um, we agreed to exchange uh, correspondence in which we defined the uh, requirements of a special prosecutor. Mm -hmm. The right to convene a jury, to issue subpoenas, staffing, and so on and so on. And when he went before the uh, Senate, I can't remember, he agreed to all of those conditions. Uh, they became known as the Stevenson Principles. And then Later, he was uh, required, ordered to fire Archibald Cox. And uh, he said, I can't do it without violating my commitment to the United States Senate. And that was the Saturday night special. Uh, you know, what do they call Massacre. it? Massacre. Massacre, which precipitated the downfall of uh, Richard Nixon as, pre as uh, president. Uh, Elliot Richardson, Archie McLeish, these were very fine people. Mm -hmm. um, 